Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first of a series of five Creative Exchange conversations, dialogues around the broad theme of water in the city and designing African blue cities for all. My name is Africa Milane, and it is my joy and pleasure to be back uh, for this year's edition of this incredible, engaging, provocative, and really creative exchange of conversation. Throughout the series, we'll be exposing you to some thought leaders in the space, academics, uh, practitioners, um, public officials who are working towards realizing the kind of city we all want to live in one day. Uh, Cape Town is a water scarce city, if you can imagine it. We are surrounded by two beautiful oceans, Atlantic to the one side and Indian to the other. And yet, despite all that water, we know what happened a few years ago when we were counting down to day zero. Juxtapose that with what happened in KwaZulu Natal last week, where more than 400 people died following 24, 36 hours of five months' worth of rainfall falling in one day. Well, that highlighted, firstly, climate change issues are a reality. And anyone who is denying that, well, let's have a conversation another time. However, more importantly, infrastructure and the design of cities around one addressing the issue of drought and shortage and scarcity of water, but the other extreme, the climate change and the flooding that happened in KwaZulu-Natal. Does Cape Town, for example, have the stormwater drainage system that will withstand that amount of waterfall in a matter of hours? I don't know. We'll find out from the experts. How do we capture the water that falls unexpectedly from the ocean uh, sorry, from the skies, where 95% of our water still comes from in Cape Town, uh, beyond the catchment areas of the traditional dams. How do we maximize use of the water that is captured in those dams? And how do we, through landscaping and town planning, make sure that the optimi optimized, I suppose, moving around of the water from the collection point to our taps uh, is realized without any wastage, and of course, health and safety issues concerned as well. The provision of water and sanitation is a constitutional right enshrined in our constitution. And the city of Cape Town, absolutely one of those cities that ensures that all citizens of Cape Town will have access to clean water as well as to sanitation. How do we realize all of that? How do we? Those are the questions we'll be answering, not only today, but over a series of five creative exchange conversations, which culminate, of course, in September when we had our hashtag co-create design festival that is going to be happening right here in Cape Town. Thank you for being part of this journey. And we hope you are going to be reflecting on the conversation this afternoon and in subsequent conversations by using the hashtag creative exchange. We're brought together, of course, by the incredible talented people from Craft and Design Institute. And in a moment, I'll introduce you to the group CEO, Erica Alk. But none of this will be possible without the incredible generosity and support of the Dutch consulate in Cape Town. And joining me on the couch is the, what are you, Sebastian? Con Consul General for <laughs> That's the, the one. Consul That's General the word for the I'm looking Netherlands. for. Sebastian Merscherschmidt. Um, he's spending his last few months in Cape Town. Oh, uh, don't start on that one. <laughs> we need, we need to start realizing. I know, no, 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 no. I'm in denial. Need, Let's, be in in denial. denial. Let's be in denial. Let's be in denial. Um, At least for today. We're not in a position, obviously, to divulge yet where you're going to. I hope you know where yeah, you're going Yeah, no, to. no, no. It's, it's, I'm going to Canada next. It's very different. Oh, is it? Very different. Very different very challenges, different. Yes. very different issues to look yes. forward to there. Yes. We have certainly enjoyed the impact you've had in Cape Town. Mm. Um, not only you as the Consul General, but obviously the Consulate and the work that you've started and your predecessors have started will certainly continue without a doubt. And I know for a fact that this is one of those projects that you are most passionate yes. about. Yes. Last year, we had a series of these dialogues yep. that culminated in a design festival, which we hosted in a hybrid fa fashion. Uh, what were some of the main takeaways from you? And why, why is it important for us to continue to give access to conversations of this nature? There's a few things, and I can, I will, you'll have to stop me because I can go on forever. Um, one of the things that last year we talked about, the fourth industrial revolution, the digitization space and how that impacted our lives and how we can make use of it. And the design process, which is really about making sure that everybody participates, from the consumer, from the, from, the, from the inhabitants of cities, from the technological people, from the governments, everybody's sides gets, um, gets taken into that process in coming to solutions. That were, that's what we're really about. And one of the subjects that we touched upon last year was water. And that to, to both South African and Dutch is such a logical 
subject to dive deeper into because both we have on both sides many experiences which warrant attention. Uh, you talked about the drought. When I arrived here in 2018, we could only use 50 liters a day in Cape Town. It came from the Netherlands where we also were experiencing some droughts, not to this level, but that got us panicking because the dikes were getting, uh, getting uh, too dry, which could mean water leaking out. And my house is four meters below water level. It tells you a little bit of the dangers of, of droughts and what that can happen also in the Netherlands. So this is really where, where the Dutch can learn from the, from the Cape Tonians, for example, because the measures that we're taking here, the consumption that went down 50% in only a few months, that's, an, that's a remarkable achievement. And it's good to see what happens next, you know, what, what, what developments have been put in place, how do we prepare ourselves for the future, because droughts are going to come back. Uh, we have El Nino, we have La Nina, all these effects in the climate space that are getting heavier and hitting us harder with climate change. So it's going to get uh, uh, harder for us in, in South Africa to deal with these issues. So we're not only passionate about this in Cape Town, also our embassy in Pretoria is working on this very hard because we look at this on a national level. Yeah. And we have, uh, we have uh, many um, agreements between South African national government, the Dutch government, on how we can collaborate. And under those agreements, water is one of the main issues. Uh, we have many programs in where we exchange uh, information and knowledge, send people back and forth to see how we can better manage water, how we can better treat water, and how we can integrate water in our lives in a sustainable way. Because it is a source of life, just like uh, oxygen is, that's going to remain pivotal for our survival. And, you know, we've been looking at climate change. It's not looking very good. Mm. So we need that focus. We need that constant focus. And just like you said, I'm also very proud of CDI stepping into this, now also in this subject, and making sure that we get that conversation not only going, but, but also continuing uh, to see where we can get to and uh, do this uh, to this wonderful work at Co-Create Design Festival again in September. Innovation, of course, becomes key because yeah. one should never waste a wonderful crisis, right? Let's Definitely. create opportunities. Let's uh, force ourselves to look at different ways of how we can come to a solution that better suits everybody. Yeah. Um, and it was one of the hallmarks last year where every conversation we were highlighting innovation both in South Africa and in the Netherlands. Yes. I imagine you're expecting something similar this year? Yes, but innovation is not only technological. Most people think when innovation, they think robots and digital and all that. But innovation is also water management. It's also how do you govern water? Who's responsible for what? How do you make sure that it's inclusive? How do you make sure that all these services that people need get delivered to everybody? Not just to a pocket of wealthy, rich people in one area, but actually create a space where everybody is benefiting from clean, healthy water management. And also, like you said, also like with the droughts, then a few, few months later, we had rainfall also in Cape Town that also were flooding some of the townships. Yeah. So that water management and the, the, the sanitation aspects of it, it's important to everybody. So the conversation is about an inclusive thing uh, where everybody and all stakeholders are involved. It's about technological, but it's also about social. It's also about political and, of course, the finances, the money. So we have to, um, we have to approach this holistically, which means design thinking. All right. Well, Sebastian has some homework because he'll be paying attention to the incredible array of speakers we've invited for you here today. And then at the end, join me again on the couch to wrap up. Thank Definitely. you very much. Let me introduce you to some of the speakers uh, who will be joining us uh, here on the couch, obviously, to speak to some of the uh, challenges here. We'll be hearing from Dr. Kirsty Carden, who's the Associate Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and the Interim Director at the Future Water Research Institute at UCT. And she'll be speaking, I suppose, from an academic lens as to whether or not this country is ready uh, for a water sensitive design and what that means actually. What does a water sensitive design uh, mean? Uh, you'll also hear from Tamsin. Tamsin Farragher is a Principal Resilience Officer at the City of Cape Town. That's an important office in the city of Cape Town. And we'll be sharing her experiences within the sector and the role of government and the private sector, obviously, in um, uh, contributing towards water sensitive design. Uh, Julia McLaughlin is a landscape architect, and she'll be talking about the role of landscape architecture um, in developing blue green cities. And then we'll hear from Martin Knight who is an associate at Okra, a landscaping ar architectural firm in the Netherlands, where he'll be sharing the global perspective on the blue-green cities and the role of landscape architecture there. Those are the speakers who are coming up today. And we're inviting you to please make sure you use the platform on, um, the Q&A platform, rather, uh, on your um, screen right now uh, to ask and pose any questions you have for any of our speakers. We'll try and get as many of them answered 
within the 90 minutes that we have your attention. Yep. Let's bring in Erica now, Group CEO of the Craft and Design Institute. Erica, we went through this wonderful exercise a year ago, and um, the Resolve Challenge was an essential part of that. What, what, what lessons did we learn from that challenge, and what wonderful successes can we celebrate from it? Um, the Resolve Challenge was one of the essential parts of the co-create a series of exchange dialogues as well as a festival uh, last year. Uh, what did we glean from it? What did we learn from it? So Africa, the, the Resolve Challenge is still in process. Um, it's been a, a kind of long, a couple of, couple of months. Um, in fact, we're nearing the end of the process. So um, the, there are about 40 participants at the moment and they are in the throes of um, preparing um, proposals for the grant funding for um, for their prototyping, so I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna divulge any anything yet. Um, we could we can actually discuss that um, hopefully in the June Creative Exchange. Um, but really, what what it, what it showed us that the sort of extent of interest in it and the extent of participation is how many people have really good ideas about um, how they can solve or what they think might be solutions to some of these of these problems. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Erica, I was going to say that water obviously was one of the themes we covered um, in not only one of the sessions of Creative Exchange like this, but it was certainly a theme that was important uh, at the festival as well. And I imagine through the Resolve Challenge, you've got some wonderful, wonderful ideas coming out uh, that are addressing particularly the challenges of water, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but I, what I, what I wanted to go on to say is that is that I think the thing that's emerging from the from the challenge is that um, it, kind of individuals with ideas is not enough. Um, that that and and I think um, Sebastian was talking about it as well. Is that actually I think you know the problems that we're dealing with are so are so complex and the solutions actually might be might be varied. But that really where you see where innovations are kind of take root is where they are involving kind of mul mul multiple disciplines, um, multi parties that they're kind of functioning in an, in an ecosystem kind of way. Um, and I mean, I think then on the, on the topic of water and I think where I'm hoping these conversations are going to go for the creative exchange going forward um, is that we're wanting to focus on, on innovation, but also the process of innovation. So we, we're going to be looking for speakers who are going to be talking about um, where where a process might have might have worked or might not have worked, and what the reasons are for either of those those outcomes. Because I think there's a lot to be learned for for innovators and for and for the innovation process in looking at um, kind of yeah case studies of of what what works and what hasn't worked. Um, All right, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Erica. I know you'll also be paying attention and taking copious notes, as Sebastian will be. And of course, we'll join uh, you again towards the end of this 90 minute um, time that we have this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Erica, of course, the CEO of the Craft and Design Institute. The first speaker is Dr. Kirsty Carden, who is the Associate Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and the Interim Director at the Future Water Research Institute at UCT. Uh, lovely to have you here, Kirsty. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's start with what your understanding is of a blue-green city. So, yeah, my understanding of a blue-green city. Um, it, a blue-green city aims to create a nature-oriented city that has um, aspects of amenity, and that also has aspects of building resilience to the impacts of climate change. So mm -hmm. we've heard quite a lot about that already this morning. Um, and, it, and what it does is that it's, it, it integrates the different sectors across the city so that those blue-green elements can start providing the buffer to the various uh, water-related risks that we've already heard about in terms of drought and flood and others that are actually all very interlinked. So what we're seeing in in places like Durban recently with those really, really um, significant floods are very similar to what we experienced in Cape Town as a consequence of Phase Zero and the droughts. Yeah. So, you know, how, how we respond to those water-related challenges comes through in the ways that we think about blue-green cities. And of course, blue-green 
sort of interlinks with other terms like water sensitive cities, water wise cities, sponge cities. They're all very similar concepts that all use some form of green infrastructure. So plants, rain gardens, swales, the sort of um, trees, different plant vegetation infrastructure within cities to um, uh, uh, contribute to this blue green space. And also the blue infrastructure, which are things like wetlands, ponds, rivers, groundwater, often forgotten, the sort of links between those, those blue assets and the green assets are what contribute to um, this livable, um, sustainable, resilient space. So when we talk of a water design or water sensitive designed city, those are the elements that are, that are, that are considered by the yeah, designers of the city. Yeah, so, so for example, yeah, I can oh, move on. Um, <laughs> there, um, water sensitive design in this case is the process. So we're talking a lot about process today. It's how we put in place the resilience building initiatives for a, a water sensitive city and the water sensitive city then becomes your destination. So those processes and the approach of water sensitive design are things like diversifying water sources, uh, bringing in sustainable drainage elements so that you have that green infrastructure that starts protecting buildings and roofs and roads and that, that sort of thing. You have things like um, naturalization of waterways, using nature-based solutions for the treatment of waste, recycling waste, um, even things even things like water conservation and demand management form part of the approach that is water sensitive design because it starts to consider all those different aspects of physical infrastructure, uh, the governance arrangements which we've heard about from Sebastian already, and obviously social engagement which is so important. In a moment, we'll speak to Tamsin Farragher, who's the Principal Resilience Officer at the City of Cape Town. How does academia help the City of Cape Town in realizing a water-sensitive design city? Yeah, so, I mean, I think our role, you know, academics have, have three main roles. The one is research, obviously teaching, and the other is what we call engaged scholarship, or sometimes social responsiveness. And it's in that space that we really do have an influence across stakeholders and it's not only local or national government it could be in business industry with consultants and with residents so what what our privilege as academics is that we are able to zoom out to a space where we don't have to concern ourselves necessarily with the day-to-day -day operations and management and even maintenance of this sort of water sensitive design space so we can start thinking about it from that innovation perspective but also from a policy leading um, perspective so that we're able to say from our grounded research and some of it is basic, some of it is uh, applied, some of it is the ways in which we think about governance of water sensitive design. But we're then able to inform policy, to contribute to guidelines, to write thought leadership, to actually and engage probably most importantly with officials themselves in terms of building these um, uh, concepts into their own day-to-day -day work. And I'm not sure if Tamsin would like me to share this, but we've been working together on a, um, on a, a groundwater governance research um, sort of area. Well, Tamsin's been working very hard on it. <laughs> I, I, I've been supervising it. <laughs> um, and th that sort of Co collaborative research is really important in a in a local space where you can start informing different ways of thinking. Uh, the previous um, public protector, Professor Tuli Madonsela, coined a wonderful term where uh, the 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 I suppose primary part of her work was responding to the needs of Gogo Lamini, and she she almost instilled that sort of image of mm -hmm. an ordinary South African who lives, uh, hopefully pays taxes if they're earning income, uh, has a healthy life and that kind of thing. How do we involve the Gogo Laminis of this world in this conversation and in this process? Yeah, oh, it's really important. Um, and it's not easy because often, you know, we, particularly as, as government tends to do things on a, in a top-down way where they use the regulations and policy and knowledge that they have to impose certain ways of doing things. But what we're seeing, if, you, if we want to transform our cities from where we are at the moment, where they really are only providing water supply and sanitation and sometimes drainage services, 
to that more um, um, uh, sort of visionary space that we call a water sensitive city, then that point of transition is going to be the point where people are involved mm. and people know what they're talking about. They understand their impact on the water environment. They understand what impact the water environment has on them. And without that, we're not going to be able to, to transition into a more water sensitive space. So some of the work that we're doing um, as part of uh, Future Water is that we lead a community of practice program in water sensitive design um, with funding through the Water Research Commission, where we build awareness, we do a lot of training, we do knowledge raising, we do um, a, a data management, we have websites, you know, we, we sort of connect with people um, on a very broad level. But apart from that, so that's the sort of training of your average stakeholder, I guess, or the ones that are particularly invested in, in doing water sensitive design. But from a man on the street perspective, it's much more about um, raising awareness through events. And when we do the research on the ground, we're doing some in Mitchell's Plain at the moment, for example, where we trying to understand whether we can use existing stormwater infrastructure ponds, dry ponds, as, as water capture sites, as, as a, a means to retrofit them with water sensitive design options and to use them to manage the groundwater infiltration and, and abstract that for water use. And the work that we've done there, we've done with local communities mm. um, so that they've helped us build the sandbag walls, they've provided the visionary processes for us to uh, um, conceptualize painted murals on, 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 on the concrete walls to tell the story, to consider how we can take this forward and to look for opportunities for the sort of multifunctionality that we're hoping to create in those ponds. Anecdotally, my day job is a broadcaster and when we were counting down to day zero, many of my listeners uh, were asking, how do you live on 50 litres of water a day? Mm -hmm. And my answer was, ask your colleague because there are many, many people in Cape Town who are living on much less than 50 litres a day. Uh, so that, that tapping into a resource that is already there because they have lived experiences and therefore can contribute very constructively towards the conversation is important. Let me ask you this. Do you think South Africa is equipped and ready to implement water-sensitive design within our cities? Yeah, so I mean, it's a good question and, and I have pondered about it actually because my sort of initial reaction would be, oh, we've got a long way to go, you know, because we, we're sort of still relatively rooted in the ways in which we've done things for so many, you know, decades, um, hundreds of years by now. But having said that, I think there are real glimmers of hope. We've got a really good policy environment now, and um, many of the big cities at least, not so much in the smaller cities, have excellent guidelines, they have good climate change awareness and policy and uh, legislation that they're now using to bring into the ways in which they do things at city. So the work that Tamsin does, and she'll explain that now, in her resilience department is obviously really critical to building awareness around water sensitive cities. So that is happening. And we are, and we have got some great examples around the, around the country of what can be. Mm. Um, if we start thinking of water sensitive design. There's some beautiful examples that the landscape architects will share that they show how we can start building in these sort of amenity and biodiversity elements and the sort of um, naturalization sort of spaces that we're wanting to see. Um, Etiquini themselves have done some fantastic stormwater work, um, sustainable stormwater management work. And it's, it really saddens me to see what happened there over the last week. But I think even with their transformative marine management programs and the, the wonderful work that they've been doing in local areas, when we confronted with storms of the magnitude that they saw, there, there's very little that you can do um, in terms of stormwater management aside from sort of protecting areas specific areas where you know they're going to be problems and really thinking about how we plan and design those cities rather than um, just dealing with the stormwater yeah. management as a whole. So yeah, it's there, there are real glimmers of hope and we're really working extremely hard to try and get. That is very good to hear. Dr. Kirsty Carden is the Associate Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering 
and the Interim Director at the Future Water Research Institute at UCT. Let me bring in Tamsin now, uh, Faraga, Principal Resilience uh, Officer at the City of Cape Town. And Tamsin, uh, Kirstie has already made reference to the work that you as a city are doing with the university or other way around. So let me ask this, what, what role do the different spheres of government have to play, the private sector, academia, and ordinary citizens, really, in creating what ultimately are going to be healthy, fun, amazing cities to live in? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I, it's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it, it, you know where to start when you think about water because it's it's it happens at so many different scales. You know it happens at a catchment scale, which is huge. It happens in a subcatchment scale, which could be a city, could be smaller. Um, it's all about you know, it's, uh, it's about surface water management. It's about water resource management, fluid streams, wetlands. Um, it's also about how you get it into pipes, how you treat it, how you treat it when it moves through systems, you know, wastewater, etc. So, you know, when you, when you start to look at it from that perspective, there's so many different entry points and so many different role players. Um, so, you know, from a national government perspective, they're the policy setters, they're the, st the strategy setters in theory. Um, but then also at a city level, we have our own bylaws, for example. Um, so, I mean, the provincial government doesn't play a significant role, but they have done amazing work during the drought in terms of benchmarking, for mm. example, for water-heavy industries. Mm. You know, how can we use our water better so that the footprint becomes smaller? Um, so they've done fantastic work from, from kind of an economic perspective, um, also agriculture. The city, when you start to look at what we're supposed to do, and you refer to the constitution at the beginning, the city is the local government. Our job is to provide water services and becomes very kind of engineering focused. It's about how we get the water in from the catchments and how we get it to people's homes or to the closest tap, as the case may be. Um, so there's that kind of engineering focus. And because the national government is responsible for water resource management, and it's the rivers, the streams, the wetlands, etc., that doesn't really happen in the cities. And this is where some of the separation has become a problem, um, particularly in Cape Town, where we treat our stormwater, uh, listen to me, our surface water as stormwater. You yeah. know, it's, it's a threat, it's a flood risk, etc. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the city's role from is, is multi-layered. It's also ties into how we plan our city, you know, where do we put our development? Um, and it's a bit awkward, you know, talking about water sensitive cities and policy, etc., when you've got a city that's developed, you know, how do you how do you start to kind of retrofit those important aspects and elements, etc. So planning decisions become a very important part of it. Do we, do we allow development in our floodplains, in our wetlands, um, which then starts to you know, tie back into how do we value our ecological infrastructure and the ecoservices that it provides? Um, I think that's something that we need to do a bit of work on. Um, then you start to look at kind of more pragmatic perspectives, again, getting back into the engineering. I mean, our stormwater um, system is largely kind of directed by roads. But it's no accident that it used to be roads and stormwater, you know, so how, this, how the roads are designed is very much about collecting water and getting it out as quickly as possible. So if you're talking about a water sensitive city, there's so many different entry points, which makes it complicated, but it's also kind of exciting because there's so many different ways that you can start to influence the system. You know, if we're going to do a road, should we have a raised curb or should we have it dropped and allow the water to actually sink into the swales and the rain gardens, etc., which well, then recharge the groundwater. It also, you know, provides the trees with and the plants, etc., with the water that it needs. So there's a lot of work that the city could be doing, and there are a lot of different um, kind of pieces of work that we have been working on. And one of the pieces that um, we pulled Kirsty in to help us with was when the district plans were being prepared. So looking at it from a spatial planning perspective and from a water sensitive planning perspective, looking at the plans and saying, well. How do we integrate this? <laughs> it's something we haven't done before, but we know we want to do it. Like, what, you know, what, what, where do we start? Um, I don't think we got it 100% right, but through that process, we were able to um, integrate our groundwater protection zones, for example, which hadn't happened before. So it's, you know, Kirsty helped us with the water sensitive um, design workshop, and we pulled in some of the groundwater experts. And, and work together to say, okay, how do we do this and, and, and what, what's the most pragmatic way and what information do we have and what don't we have? Um, so we are, there, there are lots of different pieces, including that. Um, so that's, that's a very long-winded version of the city could be doing. <laughs> what citizens could be doing is like, 
when you when you, every, every aspect of your life touches on water in some way or another when you turn the tap on when you water your garden when you when you design your roof what kind of a roof are you going to put on is it a green roof um, are you going to have gutters that join up to the stormwater system and get that water off as quickly as possible? Or are you going to divert them into a, a garden setting where it can water the plants and replenish the, you know, the groundwater, etc.? cetera? Um, so it's not just behavior in terms of, I have 50 liters, how am I going to use it most wisely? Or I have a bucket in my shower, I still have a bucket in my shower. Um, you know, so those behavioral aspects are part of it, but they're also design little interventions along the way that make a big difference. You know, do you have a dual reticulation system, for example? Are you able to put your gray water into your toilet if, if you wanted to? I mean, some people find that kind of gross, but it's 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 those which, decisions. Which, which I don't understand, by the way, <laughs> because why should we use perfectly drinkable water exactly. to flush down our number ones and number twos when that water is needed for exactly. agriculture, for nutrition, for bay? Anyway, yeah. Or rainwater, even. I mean, rainwater is also beautiful water. Yeah. But you know, so it's, I think ordinary citizens can can change not only their behavior, but also those little design, there are little design innovations um, that start to shift the needle as well. Let, let me ask this then, uh, just to hone in on the on the design and planning aspect of it. Who drives that? Is, is it, is it, I mean, is it the political offices of the various departments in the city of Cape Town that have touch points on this, where they can say, as we did with energy, that any and all buildings that are coming up have to have a plan that includes, for example, water sensitivity in their design. So it becomes a bylaw, it becomes a, a criteria, a checkbox before a, a plan is approved by the city of Cape Town. Or do you try and inspire citizens to just do it on their own anyway through, I don't know, incentives, prizes, big stars, <laughs> that kind of thing? Water stars, we do have water stars. Yes. <laughs> um, well, okay, so that's... Um, during the drought, so we had a, a 2010 bylaw uh, which prohibited the reticulation of any water other than the city's water into, the, into a, a building, whatever it is. That's still in place. Um, so if you're wanting to use groundwater, for example, or treat groundwater for potable purposes, you have to enter into a special agreement with the city. That hasn't, that, that hasn't changed. That's actually become more of a thing. And that's a good thing, right? Yes and no. <laughs> I might have to take my city hat off there. Um, so, so, and this is where the, where the governance is so important because the city is the water services provider. It is the city's job to provide water. It's not your job to provide water. It's my Correct. job to provide water. So, which is, which is why that's in place. And they, I mean, they're, they're good reasons for it as well. They're health reasons, etc. cetera. Um, but it, is a little, it was a little bit frustrating during the drought. Um, you know, we put alternative water guidelines together to help people figure out what they could use water for and which types of water. There's so many different types of water. Water is not water. It's, it's amazing. Um, so, you know, what can you what can you safely use grey water for, for example, and, and what you shouldn't, and how long should it stand for? It's, you know, if it's been sitting for 48 hours, should I rather just put it down the drain? You probably should. So those pragmatic things, and there are lots of great little drawings showing how you could connect things up and do's and don'ts and whatnot. And that was a really important piece of work that we pulled together. Um, and that then fed into the new bylaw that does require, if you are going to use alternative water, to put it on a drawing. And, yeah. and then that triggers, and there's an application process, and that triggers a site inspection by water inspector, et cetera. So we do have those elements in place, but it's not a requirement. So you know, if you're doing a new development, you can either put in water saving devices, or you could put alternative water in, and it doesn't specify how much or what type or whatever. Mm. And that's because it's actually not in the city's interest for us to be generating our own water. I hear it's that. Complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Um, we, we all went through the drought, and we all learned a hell of a lot, and hopefully the change in behaviors that we, because it was probably the greatest social experiment that Cape Town has had in a long time, right? Where we drastically reduced the amount of water we consumed on a daily basis in Cape Town. And and that crept up a little bit, but it seems to be leveling off at a, at a particular um, sort of level at the moment. Tabecha in the Eastern Cape has just gone through and probably still is in the midst of a drought where they were counting down to day zero. What lessons did other cities learn from Cape Town? Not a lot, it would sound like. <laughs> Um, it's a bit like Durban. I mean, we, Durban 
we, we were jealous of Durban stormwater planning and, and interventions and strategies. I mean, we, we sit in webinars going, that's so cool. You know, how can we do that in Cape Town? And they've just suffered an unimaginable disaster. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, what other cities could learn from Cape Town is don't assume it's going to change soon. Rather panic early. Don't grind it out um, and, and act soon. Um, I think giving people guidance, communication, really good, clear communication is important. And I, I think we, over the duration of the drought, learned lessons about communicating with people, how to and how not to. Um, but also having really good material. So that alternative water guideline was a really important part of that communication um, to um, Mrs. Lamini. Um, you know, this is what you can and can't do. Um, I think the other lesson is... Um, Sure, where, where to start? Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I, I can ramble. <laughs> and I suppose the counter question is, what lessons do we need to learn from Itekwini, right? Uh, because, yes, a lot of people can attribute bad administration over successive years to some of the challenges faced by Itekwini. But let's remind people, in 2019, there was heavy, heavy muds that were impacting on the infrastructure of Durban. Hardly two and a bit years later, there's now this devastation yeah. that has been resulted. And I would argue that even the city of Cape Town would not be able to withstand that amount of nature in one go. So we need to start asking ourselves uh, what aspects of that stormwater drainage system uh, we were enjoying and loving and almost been um, uh, envious of, uh, can we put in place, but make sure that it actually does sustain when we actually, because climate change is a reality, unfortunately. And, and Durban will have another weather system like that. Cape Town will most likely, hopefully not to the same extent, but Cape Town will most likely have to contend with something uh, like that. So perhaps let me part ways slightly on a positive note. What are good approaches that we have examples of in as far as planning and design is concerned? Um, I think these kinds of conversations are a really good start. Um, I think there is a recognition within the built environment professions that we need to be doing things differently and having conversations about what that difference could be. Um, from the city's perspective, uh, we have a, a couple of programs which are very cool. There's a Liberal Urban Waterways program, which was part of the resilience strategy. And um, we got that up and running, I think it's 2018 now. And there's a whole list of, of projects that have come out of that that are looking at river rehabilitation, river restoration. So it's looking at the, the, the natural end of, of water systems. Um, but then we also have a little project in town that we're trying to get into the next phase, which is looking at how do we um, treat water within urban environments as a resource. So many of you might not know, but the Civic Centre has huge basements and pumps out thousands of litres of water from those basements in the dewatering process that just ends up in the sea. So we're like, well, that seems like a little bit of a waste. And as a city, we should probably be thinking innovatively and progressively about this. So how do we use that water, but not just use it, how do we integrate it into the green systems of the city? So, you know, Adelie Street, there's that, there's those trees and they're planting the crafts and the parts and the whatnot. How do we adapt that space to become a water treatment factory so that our urban environments are not just um, paving and places that people walk, it's actually providing eco-services as well yeah. and improving livability and all of those good things that we want for our climate adaptive resilient cities. Um, so those programs, th that program and those projects um, I think is super exciting. Um, and and we, we're having a stab at, uh, another stab at um, water sensitive planning um, and, and learning a lot of lessons along the way about how it doesn't work. But through that process, also learning about how to do it, how to, how to hopefully do it better next time. So there's a, there's a lot of positive stuff happening in, in spite That's of good to know. the doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> that is good to know. Thank you very much, Tamsin Farage. Uh, she is the Principal Resilience Officer at the City of Cape Town. Julia McLaughlin is a landscape architect and here to talk about, uh, I suppose, the role that landscape architecture uh, can play in developing blue-green cities. Um, you will need uh, this, yes. won't you? Uh, if you don't pass, mind, pass, pass, pa the, passing it on for us, the... please. Um, so what role can your your specialised area in designing and imagining lived experiences for 
citizens of Cape Town and visitors to the city uh, play in developing blue-green cities? Oh, uh, is my mic working? Yes, yes it, it is. is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, if we, we recognise, as Kirsty and Tamsin have said, that no settlement, towns, cities, we, we don't, we can't exist or function independently of Earth's natural systems. And once you, so Earth's natural systems, obviously your groundwater, surface water systems, your biotics, your plants, animals, insects, what have you, your climate systems, and many other systems that this is the Earth, it, this is what we live in. And once you recognize that we are dependent on these natural systems, I think we, we especially in the last few decades, we've engineered a lot of these systems out of our cities. And I see the, the lands, in landscape architecture in particular, it's almost retrofitting it back into the landscape, to, well, into the urban setting. So you've got things like your, um, um, obviously stormwater piping is a definite engineering to reduce the, the flooding issues because everything's covered in impermeable surfaces. So the simplest thing is to increase your permeable surfaces at every opportunity, but you're not taking away the stormwater system, but you're just trying to now intercept and create infiltration opportunities. These can be big scale, <coughs> and often though, they're very small interventions. Um, for instance, uh, the one that we've got on the screen at the moment is uh, it's Durham Avenue, um, which we did. So it's Woodstock Salt River area, and you know Durham Avenue probably is a fairly broad street. Correct. And the opportunity arose for us to uh, create an intervention. The water, the stormwater before the intervention would just run off to the edge, straight into the stormwater pipes underground. And all we did was just, because the parking is at an angle, which is very useful, we could create a portion of that parking space, or the space in front, into a planter, infiltration. Not, uh, you know, not a raised planter, but a planter that the water can just flow over as mm. it would naturally. You've got plants that slow the water, filter it, and then you're not stopping the water from flowing into the stormwater infiltration, you're just taking the overflow. So you're still, it's a very small intervention, but can you imagine if we could put these in different locations yeah. across the city where there's your roads or, and that. But I think what is important from our perspective, it's not just providing blue-green, it's not just about the stormwater system, it's about the amenity that it provides. Because now the, the street is partially shaded, or, and you can tell which direction the southeaster comes from. With those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, we didn't plan very well for that. <laughs> those uh, wind protection elements. But um, also the planting, it, it just helps to reduce the, the, its mitigation for the urban heat island effect. Little interventions like that. And it also looks pretty. You know, those are always very valuable. <laughs> and how receptive are the key players in the space, we're talking here engineers, government and all of that, to this kind of thinking? Very, uh, look, I think once you communicate your objective and your vision, I mean, that's got to be very clearly communicated, whether through, um, through images, drawings that show ultimately what your vision is, then you get a buy-in, especially when people find out the benefits. Yeah. It's not just about the water systems, it's about amenity um, and how it could form a sort of enhancing a space or enhancing, enhancing spaces. But I think one of the, I think, let me just try and operate this. There we go. Wow, I'm a genius. Uh, um, one of the projects that we did was um, this wooden bridge, uh, the stormwater infiltration opportunity. Um, this is Woodbridge Island. And um, what was interesting about this, so the idea was to take the runoff, the surface water runoff from the car park, a very small intervention with planting um, that and in the drawings we show a depression, this, the water will flow off the surface of the car park into these uh, planters and be slowed, filtered, treated and infiltrate the groundwater. But what was interesting was when the contractor came on board and did it very quickly and we pitched up, um, we found that they'd gone and done a fairly normal, what they knew was a planter. 
a planter is raised. So we have, you know, it had to be rectified, obviously, following the drawings. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that our vocabulary, our everyday vocabulary, does not yet, you know, it's not a general understanding of system. To most people, stormwater systems, as my colleagues have mentioned, it's about removing stormwater as rapidly as possible from a yeah. settlement. And, and that's becoming a challenge. But I think gradually through demonstration projects, through you know, something as simple as signage to illustrate, those things can, can help. Well, Tamsin, we can, we can, I don't know, lobby the politicians to make it a bylaw that every single, I mean, it doesn't make sense that we don't have that everywhere in Cape Town. It's pretty. If nothing else, it's beautiful, never mind the additional benefits that come with it. It's also, to, to us, I mean, I think landscape architecture is also about enhancing space. It's about usable outdoor space as well. And that's, sorry, Tanzan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, Durham uh, Street in Salt River and, of course, uh, Wooden Bridge, Stormwater Infrared, uh, you know, this project. Are, are there any other examples uh, that, that are success, really, uh, that are coming from the sector? Yeah, sorry, that's... Uh, Globally, there's many, but I, I'm trying to focus on very much on local projects. Yeah. And they are, the numbers are growing in South Africa. But I think uh, one that I'm most familiar with, and Tamsin works nearby, I think. I know that place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, the Standard Bank Tower. So it was an addition to an um, uh, existing building. There was a large plaza out in the front. And with this additional car park structure in the center there, you can see at the top right-hand corner, what the idea was, was to integrate the building and the landscape. So what the building is doing, the new building is intercepting rainwater, it's catching it, it's, and harvesting it in tanks in the different levels. But any overflow, because you're gonna have significant storm events, any overflow is going to go into an infiltration basin. So obviously the planter, it's not a raised planter, it's a drop, it's a depressed planter. It's not very sad, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and obviously with your blue-green approach, um, so that you're reducing the pressure on the stormwater system, but you're also infiltrating the ground, you're infiltrating in to, to recharge the groundwater. But it's not just that, it's not just about water systems, it's about water systems as space. So, at this area, what we took the opportunity to do was to include um, spaces where people could gather, sit, uh, have lunch, meet friends, what have you. And that's pretty. Sorry. It really is. I like having coffee there. Oh, excellent. <laughs> By the way, I, I walk it uh, often because I, I, I go to the Artscape uh, Theatre okay. Centre quite a bit. Yeah. And I know a number of people who work uh, with Tam well, not with Tamsin, but at the city of Cape yeah. Town. And that's literally our meeting spot <laughs> almost all the time, without, without a doubt. Uh, let's, let's, I suppose, not only city of Cape Town and, and slightly more globally, uh, but particularly on the African continent, how do we translate many of our African cities into water-sensitive cities, do you think? Um. I'm not sure I can answer that very easily. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it, certainly from a landscape architect's perspective, um, I think, you see, stormwater, this traditional view that we've had over decades of stormwater being piped, we have to change our minds from stormwater being a re, a, a discharged, to be discharged as rapidly as possible to one where stormwater is an asset, yeah. it's a resource. So how do we do that? And I mean, there are so many, I'm referencing, I mean, you can look at places like Benin City, going back to the 1500s, 1400s. There was, a, there, were, there was rainfall there, but what did they do? They had courtyard houses where they actually created wells that would intercept water in these wells. Simple interventions, this doesn't require piping that. Obviously, you know, you want to check that you're, you're, you, know, you don't have much contamination. One of the, the most beautiful images um, or spatial typologies, sorry, I'm getting architectural, <laughs> um, is uh, the stepped wells of India. I yeah. mean, we were talking earlier about innovation. Something as simple as an inverted pyramid, step pyramid, going into the ground to access groundwater 
and which would fluctuate, obviously, seasonally, depending on the, 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 the season. So these spaces have been designed, they have been crafted. But what's important is it's not just water systems there, it's water systems as use. It's a community space. It's like your, you know, your traditional European villages with the town square where you would find a well. There's an association because people would collect water there. I'm not suggesting that people collect water and that's the same sort of approach here. But I mean, as self-indulgence, but what if we could have the Lotus River Canal, which is essentially a large stormwater channel that drains the water from the Cape Town International. What if we could articulate water systems as urban space, water systems as food production opportunities as part of that space, water systems as uh, sacred space, water systems as, um, as recreation and amenity, rather than at the moment what we have is we've turned our backs on them. And it's, we don't see the value, but they, if, we, if it is just about realizing those opportunities that these systems can provide, I think that's, and it's, there are ideas and there are innovations across Africa, I'm sure that, and I, I think this is often the case with, if you look at some of the, the projects that are going on across Africa, sometimes it's about learning from the past. Yeah. And that's, would be, Helpful. Very much. I'm going to throw one more question to you, which I didn't prepare you for, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> when we were thinking about energy and how we can, uh, I suppose, reimagine spaces that we, that we consume uh, in an energy efficient way, the early adopters were paying an exorbitant amount of money in order to bring in this innovation and technology. And the more people took it up, the more cost sensitive mm. it became. People would look at that and go, that's amazing. But because there are so few people comparatively who are doing it, they might think it might cost them a ridiculous amount of money. But it sounds like the, the small interventions you're talking about won't cost an arm and a leg. It's just about rethinking and reusing the budget that you have yeah. to then reimagine and repurpose the flow of water. Yeah, and, and often it is about, and that's why I said, at the, I mean, talking to clients, developers, city officials and getting their buy-in. And once you can illustrate, whether it be through pretty pictures or that, that does help. So there is innovation required in that regard. Um, but I think, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tabs and you are excited by this, surely, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is reimagined though, okay. it's not. At least you have one ally in the 26,000 force of the city of Kent. <laughs> same thing, same thing. With, I mean, that, that, that's, that's exciting thinking. It is very exciting. I mean, I think just to add to what Julia is saying, what it will require. So the costing thing has been largely, it largely balances out in terms of, the, of what you are able to do um, from, a, from a stormwater flood uh, prevention perspective. What, what can be quite difficult, and it comes back to the idea of governance again, mm -hmm. that we were talking about right at the very beginning, is how to govern these new systems yeah. in, a, in an environment that is not really prepared for them. So maintenance becomes tricky. Whose assets are mm -hmm. these? And who maintains them? And how do they maintain them as green space rather than concrete pipes, which can be you know, cleaned out? So, so it's those sort of things that do need rethinking, but none of that is impossible. And it is just a change, a shift in the way we I would view argue our that communities in Cape Town, particularly, and I imagine in many cities across the country, would be absolutely convinced into taking part ownership of these spaces. Yeah. Um, once again, in my day job as a broadcaster, we were looking forward to Earth Day on Friday, and a listener called in to say, well, what we are doing in Tableview is going into our stormwater drainage system and clearing it because we are preparing for the winter that obviously is heavy rainfall in Cape Town. Mm. If this was sold to Sue from Tableview, she would absolutely get her community to then take part ownership of it, help in the maintenance. Mm. The city, I think, will still need to take primary responsibility of, of maintaining those spaces. But community can be easily convinced to take ownership of that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Look for Urban Waterways program, this is what we're hoping for. This is what we're dreaming about. Um, and, and very much 
you know, centered and grounded within the idea of partnerships and community partnerships and community ownership, not just intimate partnerships is one thing, but community ownership is almost something a little bit different. But some of the some of the, the challenges that we're really starting to come across is is this um, we don't value nature. Nature is like seems rather nice to have. It's something fluffy, you know. Rich people have have nature. You know, it's not everybody doesn't get to have nature. Don't, don't ask, it really does seem to be like that. Um, and as a consequence, this this selling these kinds of ideas, it's, it's tricky. And because, also because stormwater is seen as an engineering thing, mm. selling this as an alternative to to people who've been doing it for many years and it's established, etc., is hard. So. That that that's that's you know part of the shift that we're trying to make, um, but already you know some of the some of the teams who, some of the design teams in the local urban waterways program have commented that they're battling to get to get that shift that it is coming down as an engineering focused thing, um, so we have to remind everyone it's a little urban waterways program project and we do things differently, <laughs> which is difficult but we we persevere. How do you? Um... What's the saying? Something about the elephant, a bite-sized piece at yeah, a time. Exactly. Let's yeah. do it that way. Let's all do our little bit, and then eventually people will realize what you are doing. I'm very excited, ladies. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Julia McLachlan, of course, landscape architect. Before that, Tams and Farragher, principal resilience officer at the city of Cape Town. And we started off with Dr. Kirsty Carden, who's the associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and the interim director at the Future Water Research Institute at UCT. We are inviting you to continue to pose your questions. The ladies will be here up until half past three uh, to answer your questions. So please use the Q&A function on the platform uh, to answer those, oh, to ask those questions and pose them of the ladies. Uh, while we get our next speaker ready, Martin Knate, who is a founding partner of Okra, which is a landscaping architectural firm in the Netherlands, let me tell you about the artwork that you are seeing uh, behind me. It's by Simon Sefton. Uh, and you can find him on simonsefton.com. That was lucky enough to join us at the Desmond and Luya uh, Dudu Foundation uh, right here on Batenkant. We'll be able to walk around and uh, view the artwork, but uh, we invite you to go to his website, Simon Sefton, spelled S-I-M-O-N-S-E-P-H-T-O-N.com uh, to go and view the work. Uh, Berries on the Bank is the one just behind me which is on your screen now. And the image was taken on a mountain stream in the East Cape Highlands near Barclay East. Uh, some orange berries on the bank above the stream combined with sky, bushes, and grass to create a colorful surface above the looming shadow of a submerged rock, while a light breeze and slow shutter uh, speed provide a restful, dreamlike impression as the ruffled surface blurs. Um, this is a deeply meditative picture and have it hanging above uh, anyone's desk, really, as a reminder of one's past. It was taken on the farm where uh, Simon Sefton um, uh, was raised and uh, father, obviously, was there before him. Uh, and a stimulus to reflect and to meditate. Uh, water, as you know, is a precious element that binds the earth and humanity uh, inextricably uh, in a permanent but ever-changing bond. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful image. Um, yes, you'll be seeing it electronically, but when you see it in person, you just you you you're mesmerized by it, and you you sort of stand in front of it and you just take it in in every way possible. Uh, Simon Sefton has provided some other artwork for us. We will be sharing a link to uh, his uh, incredible artwork um, in um, on the platform here uh, in order for you to obviously enjoy it when you can. Um, uh, questions uh, on the platform, but also you can use the uh, social media platforms that you share with your networks. Hashtag creative exchange uh, is the hashtag we're asking you to share. Reflect on what is inspiring you. Reflect on what is exciting you. Uh, questions that you might have. As Erica said earlier, we'll be questioning also the processes that we are following. And if you are in the space and in the sector and can give input to that, we certainly welcome that as well. So use the hashtag creative exchange uh, to be part of the conversation. Martin Knate, as I said, is an associate at Okra, a landscaping architectural firm uh, in the Netherlands and joins us in Cape Town. Um, hello, Martin. Hi. Are you good today? Yeah, perfect. It's a perfect <laughs> day, isn't it? It is a beautiful, beautiful day. How long have you been in Cape Town? Uh, I, just, I arrived just yesterday. Oh, wow. I'll stay for a week. And um, 
I'm happy to stay here for a week. Yeah. I will tell you that it is not going to be as hot as it's been yesterday <laughs> and today. <laughs> Temperatures go down significantly tomorrow. There'll be fog in the morning, which brings the temperature down to 21 <laughs> degrees Celsius. But it's also in bad. It's probably warm for somebody coming from Europe, right? <laughs> in this time of the year. Uh, for those who don't know, tell us about Okra. What um, is Okra? We are a landscape uh, architecture firm um, working on uh, what we call uh, creating healthy cities. And um, we think it's, it's really important that we change, change our cities into blue-green cities, also change the um, amount of uh, vehicle, vehicle traffic into slow traffic, public transport, and uh, also make uh, uh, cities more attractive to live in. So social inclusiveness is, in fact, really important. We now talk about water and green, but as you heard already from Kirsty, um, it's also about people. Mm -hmm. People have to um, be comfortable in the city and enjoy the city, enjoy the green. And um, a green, uh, blue city, I think, is uh, really attractive. Uh, Julia gave us some wonderful examples of how uh, landscape architects can really, and often through very minimal interventions, really change the experience that we have as human beings who are, you know, interacting, interfacing, consuming that space. Uh, those are examples in South Africa and touching a few examples in Africa. What, what role from your work and your experience does landscape architecture play in helping to design these blue-green cities? I think um, what's really interesting uh, about what Julia is showing is that it's about small scale projects. So already small interventions, but if you have many massive amount of interventions that changes the city. And I think what uh, was Tamsin uh, pointing out too is that you also need to plan for it. So plan for blue green cities. And uh, I hope to show you some, uh, some examples of both. Uh, because I think it's a combined strategy. We need to change our attitude towards cities uh, in a drastic way. Otherwise, um, uh, we'll face the problems in the future. I'm happy for you to start showing those examples, by the way. You should have the indicator next to you. Because what I also want to focus on are some of the success stories uh, in innovative design in this space and the sector. Well, talking about uh, African blue-green cities, uh, I think the challenge in Africa is um, really, really ma massive. Um, if you talk about uh, the amount of cities and expansion of cities, it's more than Europe and America uh, in uh, over 265 years that is now uh, at stake. So if we want to create blue-green cities, um, we need to acknowledge that this, this is, I think, in the next years, uh, the case. And um, in Africa, there's also a special challenge since 50% of African people live in informal cities. So we can talk about all these nice European uh, examples, but it's not working in many of the cases. Let's say at least only in half of the cases. Um, there's also a, a, a change in the amount of energy and nutrients that will be used when we construct these cities. So at this moment in Africa, uh, let's say the, the whole continent is only consuming um, the amount of energy that in Europe is used in a small country. So uh, in the future... And that's, that's, that's an advantage, right? The, the fact that we obviously... Look, it, it's unfortunately through circumstances, socioeconomic challenges that we're facing that reality. But the fact that we are... Um, consuming uh, minimally is probably a good idea, right? Yes. In fact, in fact, that might help uh, to find uh, appropriate solutions. Uh, once that you acknowledge that this is the fact, and once that you acknowledge that uh, there's an opportunity mm -hmm. and not just only a threat, then this might, be, uh, uh, might lead to innovative solutions coming from Africa where Europeans can learn from. I think that will be the case in the, in the next decades. Exactly. So, um, we worked in, in Ghana, um, um, which is here on the slide. And um, uh, in Ghana, uh, the main city, Accra, faces that many problems that uh, you and Habitat were asking uh, a team, uh, uh, MLA Plus, Fabric, Mixed Urbanism, and more, and us, uh, to work on some innovative ideas and to create a new city just east of Accra. 
And uh, the idea was that uh, it should, um, uh, should tackle some problems with flooding. Uh, well, it, it's now you have today the, the really terrible situation at Durban, but in, in Accra, um, it's happening every year. And let's say 20 years ago, it was every three years. So it's occurring more often. And once that these floods uh, take place, there's also fires um, because the infrastructure is uh, uh, collapsing. And if you talk about social aspects, the poor suffer the most. So it is, it's almost incredible that you see this picture um, because it is happening in, in, in areas where people don't have a thing. Well, that was a reality for us in Cape Town this past weekend where the official figures now are 767 people were displaced um, as a result of a fire that took place in an informal settlement called Joe Slova, which is literally less than 10 kilometers away from where we're sitting right now. Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, it's also related to flooding. So you think it's a fire, but in this case, uh, all, the, all the infrastructure is uh, damaged, the underground infrastructure, and then a gas leak or a, a pump station or something else might happen and then suddenly you have a fire as well. Mm. So it's an accumulation of, of uh, threats um, that's taking place. Now I'll bring you to the, to the area. Um, um, it's uh, called Ningo Pram Pram. It's, uh, it's just open land, but if you look at it uh, uh, on, on, let's say, on the map, you would say, well, it's almost flat. But in this case, it's, it looks a little bit like the Cape Flats. There is a lot of... Um, uh, water water uh, streams or possible potential water streams. Uh, so if we would draw the map uh, uh, just uh, a few meters higher, the water a few meters higher, then you get this blue picture. So we decided that you should not make a grid like the people from UN Habitat usually like to, to propose. But we said, well, let's start with greening. So could we, couldn't we create green spaces um, along these rivers, watersheds, and what you call in Northern Africa, wadis, which is, a, let's say, a potential bias spill. And um, then if you talk about the informal uh, settlements that will occur, of course, even in the planned city, it will occur, then, then you, you need to think about what could be a potential programming of these green spaces. Because it's, it's nice to have green spaces, but if you, for instance, if you go to uh, the Cape Flats, um, green spaces are under threat because if you don't have a place to stay, if you don't have a place to build your home, where are you going to build it? Mm -hmm. You're going to build it in, in areas that are under threat. And that causes danger to those people. It also creates uh, a, a kind of terrible situation after the flood because it brings waste and other pollution to other areas as well. So the programming is important and in Ghana there's a law on riparian zones along streams and rivers so we decided also to, to make these potential um, agricultural areas, urban farming. Um, and then um, work uh, uh, via some topologies on what could you do close by the sea, what could you do uh, a little bit more downstream, and what could you do upstream, because the situations are different. And then just these are just ideas on how could you program these green spaces. So maybe there can be fish ponds, maybe there can be just small urban farming, maybe there can be in some places also sports fields. So things that you can, that people can imagine, not that I can imagine, but that people can imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually, as planners, you can say, okay, then we have a, a circular system. So we have something on water, we have something on food, on waste, and on energy. Uh, on water, of course, that's the, in, this, in this context the most important. It's about uh, uh, thinking about how the, the, the system might work. So there's always what we call a watershed. So the difference between one water system and another uh, system. And if you think of uh, in history of uh, cities, this is most, most of the time the high streets or the places where churches were built because it's the highest grounds. It's always safe. And then 
That's clever. I didn't know that until now. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, people in the past were more clever oh, than than we uh, tend to be. That of course, they attention. they they had they had the favor of just the opportunity to, to select their places. Mm. Um, That's a trivial pursuit question, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, learning from the past in many cases helps. Yeah. I think here in Cape Town there are underground rivers. Uh, or now they're underground, but at one moment they were upstream, uh, there were canals, uh, it all has vanished. And I think uh, uh, if you would talk to, to Kirsty, she could explain the scientific uh, meaning of that, that uh, if you would bring it back, what potential you would have. Yeah, we can learn. Um, then then um, talking about food, uh, in, in many cases uh, in Ghana, but here also in, in South Africa, in Cape Town, there are these organizations who, who actually uh, produce f locally food. I think here it's Abali Abalimi. Um, Michelle, Michelle. And uh, there are women who are, mostly it's women, who are really working hard on, uh, on urban agriculture to produce food and to make something uh, for families and for uh, local communities. And I think that's potential of these spaces. And then, well, this is more technical, how it flows down to, let's say, the neighborhoods and how can you distribute the water that, collect, that you collect at the home uh, towards the system and then bring it in, in, in doses and that are normal doses to the, to the, to the rivers and streams. And uh, what is nice is that here you see that at every scale, uh, things could work. So at the home, you can collect already uh, your water from the roof and at the street, you can collect water in these small places that you've seen uh, in Julia's examples. And then, of course, you could have the big system. It's all interlinked. Mm -hmm. And the one thing doesn't exclude the other. Um, then here you see it a bit uh, in systematic way. And if I move to the other one, and the next one, if you would plant those, those um, blue spaces and plant it with trees, then you also have a big cooling effect. Unfortunately, you see also here in, in the Cape Flats that there are not many trees. So it's also a kind of social injustice that trees are apparently for, let's say, the, 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 the rich parts of the city. And in the, in, the, in the other areas, there is hardly any tree planting. And that makes places like, on a day like this, it makes them hotter. And this is, let's say, the shading that could work on a micro scale. Here you see the plan. Wow, that is, it, it looks like a strange plan. And, and the, the man from, from UN Habitat, the, the project manager, at first he had to, a little bit to, to, to think about it. Because he said, normally we just make grids. And this looks like a, a kind of strange, well, cauliflower pattern. <laughs> um, um, but then we explained them that it would be, let's say, neighborhoods of about 60,000 inhabitants hmm. each, which create a big city. And um, uh, then you also have the city for the millions. So even this, the big cities, you should not plan from scratch, but plan with the landscape, I would say. Now, now we move to, to Kailitsa, that's the second, second uh, um, project I would like to show. Together with um, uh, RCDC, Lufen, and Nathan, we have been working uh, on a place. And this is a school premises. Um, initially, we talked to somebody in Cape Town. He said, oh, but there are nice cool, cool places in, in the townships. People have places to, to play, etc." Well, it's just sand. Um, but it's fenced. So that this is the place where potentially you can do things since there are no, no buildings apart from the school buildings. So um, in, the idea is to, to create a kind of green hub, um, sports fields, uh, gardens, vegetable gardens in this case, uh, playgrounds, and uh, early learning center. And if we could manage to do that, then there's a huge potential because only in Kailitsa there are already 56 schools. And um, if you would count the number of schools in the whole Western Cape province, there's a, a huge potential. And the nice thing is that this, this is something that the community could do. 
So I think it links to, to Julia's story that you could do things on a small scale. Of course, we were drawing first uh, also a map on the larger scale. Since if you talk about climate issues in Kailice, there are these wetlands around the, uh, the, 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 the neighborhoods. And I talked to people and they said, well, but children never go there. People, children don't know what nature is, even if it's close by. Because people struggle that much to survive that even the nice things that are there are hardly recognizable. And that's a, a pity. So in the end, it's also a change of, of perspective for children over there. It is something that we need to do. And of course, we are planners. We do this in this kind of toolboxes. Uh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> we don't want to punish people, but it's, um, um, uh, it's, it's water tools. So first, you try to uh, collect the, the, the water. Then you try to recover it, harvest it, reuse it. And then uh, also, in this case, in, 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 in the townships, also enhance efficiency. So people are already efficient, but uh, let's say the pipes of the school are leaking, toilets are leaking. So if you could repair that system, it would, uh, somebody calculated on it, if we could repair it for all schools, then you could, on one year, you could build a school for that amount of money, just to, if the pipes are working again. Of course, circularity, green structure, climate comfort, but also social values. Um, so the educational purpose, but also a uh, boost of interaction. And to talk about water, um, if you think too big in, the, in, the, in this area, um, it will not work. Um, people are really, really uh, trying to change things. But you, you need to be capable of change. So first we started with a small tool. So here are, here are some tools. Um, we identified them for that area. The area that is just in the middle of the, the picture down, uh, just uh, with this uh, black square uh, box. Yeah. And um, um, then we said, well, okay, what can we do? We can collect water from the roofs. We can bring it to a vegetable garden. Uh, there can be a sport pitch. Uh, we can in the in uh, in the in a patios we can also collect water, plant some trees, and um, then uh, we can create um, uh, maybe a small corner where with what we call in in let's say very difficult words aquaponics and hydroponics uh, we can actually bring down the water to the garden, uh, have some plants in the wall, uh, collect the water, and and have the vegetable garden running and then um, it might work. In this case, um, it's not just theory, it is also practice because there is a vegetable garden and um, um, it is embedded in the local community. I think that's important. The, 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 the real hero is the man on the left, that's Jeremy. And Jeremy is maintaining the garden and he has respect. So people, people believe his words and um, he is also the man who is very patient and working on it already for five years. And um, the fact that it will work means that there's somebody like Jeremy who cares about it and who tries also to educate children. Uh, there were some 10, ten children uh, helping uh, for a year on it. They got a diploma, they got a, a small course on the, on the, for agriculture from Abalimi. And they start to love growing vegetables. Uh, there are also some trees, they are not on this picture. Uh, Sebastian planted uh, the first yeah. one, a coral tree, yeah. and we're yeah. really grateful for Sebastian to, uh, to do this. And it's still growing, right? It's still growing. <laughs> didn't yeah. do that a job. <laughs> <laughs> At first it needed some water, but Jeremy was <laughs> taking care of it, first, and then after three years, it's really growing from itself. No, yeah. that's amazing. I mean, and, and, and thank you for bringing such a practical example of uh, what is happening on the African continent and bring it close to home where there would be um, opportunities. Because the challenges that Africa, the continent, faces are quite unique. And as you said earlier, there's 
from those challenges and you know why waste a wonderful crisis uh, you can bring about innovation and lessons that the rest of the world including Europe can learn from us yeah and and the nice thing is that that there are many small-scale projects that are really viable yes. I think in Europe we tend sometimes to to think about a complex and big problems and to make things overcomplicated and here you see that uh, a small project can already make a change. And if you just can replicate it, replication of projects, I think that will be really important. Let, let me let me ask this then as a, as a parting question. And, and Nikki, thank you very much for the questions. We'll, we'll go through them uh, at a lightning speed. Um, how does South Africa f feature or fare um, on the global stage when it comes to blue-green cities? Well, that's hard to say because the situation for South Africa is unique. Um, I think there are many things to do still to do. Um, when you when you look at the informal city, there are not many many example projects, but there are some. Um, so I think the, the potential is that if you could add on several type uh, demonstration projects, not only on schoolyards, but maybe also close by community centers, some, sometimes maybe art projects, maybe greening street projects, then maybe these projects might help to, to create awareness and to create examples for the rest of Africa. I've seen in Ghana, for instance, that people really value um, South African knowledge. They, they value that knowledge that much that there are always some people from South Africa uh, related to, to the larger projects. I think that is also uh, an important fact that South Africans can do. Yeah, Martin, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, now time to answer some of your questions and we will need a microphone uh, with the uh, ladies, please, uh, who were, uh, and Tamsin, Julia and Kirsty, I'll leave it to you to decide who's gonna pick this question. Uh, doesn't water sensitive design start with asking and interviewing communities? It sounds like uh, they're only involved once the concept is developed. Um, shouldn't they be part of the process almost from the, from the beginning? Um, who would like to grab that, that question? Tamsin, well done. That's okay. Um, okay, so as you guys have been reminded a number of times, I work in the resilience department, and resilience is about people. And it's about personal resilience. It builds city resilience um, through resilience systems, etc. So if we use that as a starting point, absolutely. Um, I think what we've discovered through trying to, Kirsty and I through and, and others, um, trying to promote blue-green cities and water-sensitive design is that people don't quite get it. Because I think it's so simple, they're expecting something more complicated. Um, so you have to take people on that journey right from the beginning to get them on board. Um, Particularly if you're expecting those people in that community to to have to, to buy in and to own that project, um, if you if that's your outcome that you're intending, which it is, um, that's the only way to do it. Even if it means you find a Jeremy, for example, who lives in the community in Kailicha, who's then going to help you as city officials uh, engage and extract uh, desire, aspirations, uh, wishes, you know. Somebody with a five-year-old, for example, would want a different use of space to somebody like me who doesn't have children. Um, and, and we must be able to coexist in that space. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, Julia um, will agree that, you know, as landscape architects, you're constantly working with communities to work out what the best use is and how to overlap and get the most out of your, out of your A, your design, B, your resources, C, the spaces. And there's always going to be overlap. Um, and that's part of the process, is evaluating how to do that most sensitively and practically. All right. It looks like the next one is also for you. Uh, it's from YouTube. Somebody saying, shouldn't developers be required to implement grey water recycling for new complexes? It will help water saving and also the sewage system. You, you alluded to it earlier where there is a guide, but it's not a requirement. I can't speak for the city on that one. <laughs> Personally, I think absolutely. Um, I know there are challenges, and um, some of the sewage treatment issues in Cape Town are certainly blocking development. And it, what what's now happening is there does seem to be a push towards um, on on site treatment. 
So there might well be just out of necessity um, a shift in, in how we approach that. Christine, do you want to comment? Maybe just to say that there are risks with grey water recycling. So there's been quite a lot of work done. In fact, uh, Future Water has done a lot of work on grey water recycling, looking at the use, the management and use of grey water, particularly from, well, both from sewered areas and non-sewered areas, where, of course, grey water recycling happens anyway, because people having to walk for water, you make sure they use that water as much as possible. So it does get reused. Um, there are significant health risks with grey water use um, that many people are not cognizant of. So it really does need to be used in very quite specific, for very quite specific uses with risk fa yeah. factors brought in. So the city does have guidelines um, for the use of grey water, but to actually legislate it into you must use your grey water um, could cause problems, I would think. I hear you. I do appreciate that. Uh, uh, Sebastian and Erica have literally left you with uh, <laughs> uh, two minutes um, because it has been fruitful. It has yes. been exciting in many ways. It's lovely to know that there's already a lot of thinking in this space, both within the city, in academia, in practice, as far as landscape architecture is concerned. Lovely to see that we, we're not as far behind in terms of thinking as mm -hmm. the rest of the world is. And in fact, there's a lot to learn yes. within the African continent as far as the space is concerned. In some ways, you actually have a better starting point, like Martin already said, but in other ways, you don't. So one thing I'm really curious about for further conversations also, you have ever-growing cities in, in Africa, and especially also in South, South Africa. Even the, in the few years that I've been living here, when I drive to the airport, I see settlements growing by year. And these informal settlements need clean water, need water management, all of it. So how do, you, how do you account for that? How do you make sure these people also, because it keeps growing. So how do you scale those small initiatives? How do you replicate? Is there money? Is there community involvement? And that's also, that was a question on my mind where I was getting really optimistic hearing about all the technical engineering solutions that are possible. At the same time, I'm thinking, okay, these are possible, but then what? How do you actually implement is there money? Is there community involvement? How do you get the community involvement? How do you replicate? So there's a lot still to talk about. Uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's four more creative exchanges where we are going to be unpacking that. And Erica, one of the issues that, that, that I know you're interested in is around the processes that are involved in realizing, I suppose, uh, what we all desire and want. What were some of your main takeaways from today? I think the, the the one thing that struck me is that I think that this, the comments about kind of learning from the past is that I often think that actually we've got more more stupid as we've got um, kind of kind of more developed and that we've we've separated ourselves um, through our sort of concrete jungles from from nature and that. Um, that I mean, I, I understand that the kind of the, the, the management of, of water and kind of all of the issues is, is complex in an environment where you have millions of people and you're needing to service them. But also it feels to me that, uh, that there is a lot of it that's kind of like common sense. And, and what we've lost is people's understanding of how we live um, in, in, at one with, with nature. And so I think a big a big take out for me would be how are we communicating, how are we we bringing back or educating citizens, all you know, from from developers to to you know citizens using water in their in their own home spaces. Is that how do we actually respect these natural resources? Um, and then how do we and how do we then also respect the systems that are bringing these natural resources to us? That was my one. My other my other take out. Was around, I think our the, the, the sort of terminology and and um, I can't remember who, who who spoke. I think it was Kirsty about a sort of asset based thinking around around stormwater. And so there's also a lot about about our language. What if we started speaking about rainwater or pure water instead of instead of stormwater? Might we have um, a different attitude to to how we think about about that resource? So very kind of philosophical, um, but but yeah, I'm, I'm like like Sebastian, I'm very interested to you know to go carry on on, on this journey, um, and understanding a little bit more about how how water impacts on our lives in multiple ways, not just in the in the built environment way. 
Thank you, Erica. This was the first of what will be a series of five creative exchanges between now and August, all culminating in the Co-Create Design Festival, which is going to be in September. The next meeting is going to be on the 18th of May. And where we'll be taking this conversation towards is where the blue and the built and the natural environment meet. Um, it, it's all in the quest of how do we design African blue green cities. We've we spent a lot of time understanding the context and the challenges and the opportunities really that exist in the space and how we can use certainly landscape archi architecture to perhaps rethink about how we harvest water, how we capture it, how we use it, how we create uh, wonderful green environments for uh, humanity to exist and to to um, to interact. Now, where does it meet with the built and the structures, basically, the buildings that we live in, the schools we go to, the hospitals uh, that we, we, we face? That's going to be the focus of our next conversation. That's happening on the 18th of May, and I hope you're going to be joining us. Um, please help me say a huge thank you to our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Kirsty Carden from UCT, Tamsin Farragher from the city of Cape Town, Julia McLaughlin, who is a landscape architect, and of course, Martin Knate, who is an associate at Okra, which is a landscaping architectural firm. Thank you to each and every one of you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Erica, um, the uh, Dutch uh, consulate in Cape Town, and obviously, by extension, the embassy uh, in Pretoria, as well as the Craft and Design Institute and the work that you are doing in this space. Uh, remember to continue the conversation using the hashtag, using the hashtag, co uh, sorry, creative exchange, hashtag creative exchange. Let's continue the conversation, ask questions, share with us ideas, tell us what is happening in your space that you think should be uh, celebrated. And thank you to our featured artist today, Simon Sefton. You can go to his website, simonsefton.com. This is a magnificent piece of artwork, and you'll see more of the artwork that he does. We'll see you on the 18th of May. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody.